As I mentioned previously, interrogation of the middle cerebral artery is also very useful in evaluation of the baby. One can easily recognize the middle cerebral artery at the base of the skull, where the circle of Willis is, The middle cerebral artery comes off anteriorly on each side of the circle of Willis. Bony landmarks we can see right beneath this are the lesser wings of the sphenoid, and this is the Petrus pyramids back here. Unlike the uterine artery and the umbilical artery, resistance in the middle cerebral artery is generally quite high early in pregnancy. What this reflects is that under normal circ circumstances with a normal placenta, there is no preferential blood flow to the baby's brain. Resistance does go down during pregnancy, but usually of the peak systolic velocity to that of the end diastolic velocity is never less under normal circumstances than that seen in the umbilical artery. When one is interrogating the middle cerebral artery to actually determine speed of blood, the angle of interrogation should be as close to zero degrees as possible. Otherwise, simple ratios are useful in the evaluation of intrauterine growth restriction. Interrogation for the actual speed of the blood is valuable in the assessment of fetal anemia. It has been recognized that abnormal wave forms in the middle cerebral artery at early gestational ages, abnormal being very low resistance patterns, like that seen in the umbilical artery at early gestational ages, is associated with an increased risk for fetal demise and intrauterine growth restriction. If I was going to summarize some of this information, I would say that there are some basic concepts one should take home from normal and abnormal Doppler waveforms. Under normal conditions, there should be low resistance in the placenta and comparatively higher resistance in the middle cerebral artery. Under normal circumstances, there is no preferential blood flow to essential organs. Under abnormal conditions, on the other hand, where blood flow to the placenta is reduced during diastole, there is preferential blood flow to those organs that are essential, particularly the brain and the heart. This preferential blood flow results in diversion of blood flow to non-essential organs while the baby is in utero. And here specifically, the kidneys receive less blood. Ultimately, if there is less kidney perfusion, there is le less urine output, and less amniotic fluid surrounding the baby. As I mentioned previously, interrogation of the middle cerebral artery is also very useful for the evaluation of fetal anemia. Excellent studies have shown that accurate measurement of the peak systolic velocity in the MCA can help us ascertain a fetal risk for significant fetal anemia. The conditions most often seen, again, are isoimmunization,
infection with parvovirus B19. And fetal maternal hemorrhage. As may be seen during a partial placental abruption or a following trauma to the placenta, or even spontaneous. Point in fact is anything that causes fetal anemia can result in an increase in the peak systolic velocity. And when peak systolic velocities are greater than 1.50 multiples of the median for the gestational age, there is 100% specificity of the possibility of having a baby with a fetal anemia. Sensitivity is still low, but the specificity is extraordinarily high. The other blood vessel we frequently will interrogate is the ductus venosus. This is the intra-abdominal vessel coming off the intra-abdominal portion of the umbilical vein that actually is responsible for diverting blood through the right atrium across the foramen of alley and directly into the left part. This way, the most oxygenated blood has direct access to the systemic circulation. Evaluation of the ductus venosus waveform is a little bit more difficult, but when one has obtained the correct landmarks for detecting the ductus venosus, a normal waveform is very recognizable. This part of the wave is the S wave and represents ventricular systole. This wave is called the D wave and represents early diastole. And the A wave is this nadering of the wave complex that reflects atrial contraction. What we have learned over time is that abnormalities of this waveform, associated particularly with either widening of the A wave or deepening of the A wave can be correlated with fetal cardiac decompensation over time. It is often one of the last events prior to fetal demise in utero when the other Doppler waveforms we've discussed have become abnormal. This is not invariable, but it is often a sign that fetal cardiac decompensation is occurring. In summary, I've pointed out multiple indications for actually performing Doppler flow studies. When there's an abnormality or a suspected abnormality of placentation, when there's evidence of placental insufficiency, regardless of the size of the baby. Most often placental insufficiency occurs with very small babies, but there are rare circumstances where very large babies will outgrow the capacity of the placenta to support themselves. We mentioned fetal anemia of any cause. There are often abnormalities associated with fetal chromosomal abnormalities. Indeed, if a Doppler waveform, for example, in the umbilical order is abnormal and a, fe and a fetus has physical abnormalities, the risk for chromosomal abnormalities goes up dramatically. Abnormalities of fetal growth, decreased fluid, a poor OB history. In a patient who has lost pregnancies, had early onset preeclampsia, severe intrauterine growth restriction in the past, known maternal risk factors such as hypertension 
and sometimes diabetes, particularly long-standing and associated with vascular disease, multiple gestations. Abnormal maternal screening. For example, an abnormal AFP. Maternal trauma. Suspected abruption of the placenta. Known isoimmunization. And as we mentioned before, exposure to parvovirus B19. Special circumstances include fetal high drops. This list is not at all inclusive. But they are circumstances under which Doppler flow velocimetry can help evaluate the status of the baby, progression of fetal complications, and aid in the evaluation of timing of delivery.